Hello, everyone. Welcome to the eighth webinar of the Sustainable Cities MOOC. Uh, today, we have with us uh, Mr. Rafael Tutts, who will be taking our uh, webinar on, on the specific topics of land planning, management, environmental management, and the politics of change. He'll also start his discussion with the SDGs. Uh, this week, the module deals particularly with how environment can be protected and cities be made resilient, a theme which cuts across several sectors, that is land infrastructure, demographics, and environment, amongst others. To introduce Mr. Tuts, he's the director of the program division at UN Habitat based in Nairobi, Kenya. He's also the acting coordinator of housing and slum upgrading upgrading branch of UN Habitat and led UN Habitat's contribution to the post-2015 development agenda. His other work for UN Habitat include the creation of the Localizing Agenda 21 program, the implementation of the global campaign on urban governance, as well as the leadership of the training and capacity branch and the city's climate change initiative. His work on sustainable urban development includes a focus on spatial planning, environmental planning, and climate change action planning within the perspective of local government cap government capacity development. Here's over to you, Ralph. Thank you very much, Gargi, and um, uh, welcome to everyone to this uh, webinar. So indeed, I'm going to focus on uh, environmental planning and management and the politics of change. Uh, this this really refers to uh, my my one of my previous roles at United Nations Habitat when I was head of environmental planning a couple of years ago, and also I was later heading the urban planning and design branch. But let me focus really on the environmental planning aspects and how this relates to current uh, thinking about development. Maybe just to to preface the um, the the talk is the assumption that we are going to take is that cities offer some of the best solutions to environmental and ecological problems and if we we deal with cities in a proactive way if we deal with cities in um, in a plant in, a, in a, when they're well financed well managed well um, planned then they can uh, provide solutions that go beyond in fact addressing the environmental issues but have also social and economic positive implications so that's the the premise and i think this is the premise that has been developed over the years and that came became very strong with the adoption of the sustainable development goals with a separate standalone goal on cities on sustainable um, in fact, the exact wording is on inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable cities and human settlements, which really makes the premise that a sustainable urbanization is a driver for sustainable development. So um, in, in, that, in that agreement, which was actually a, a landmark agreement for the development community, because it has uh, defined since 2016 all the the flow of development aid uh, and um, support um, and also has oriented the way in which um, all, sit all countries and cities, north and south, east and west, are orienting their, their priorities, making a selection of specific targets and goals and indicators related to the sustainable development goals. So it, it has become the predominant paradigm uh, since since 2015 and I'm, I would like to focus and this is in the light of the upcoming um, high-level political forum in July uh, this year where we will um, discuss not only SDG 11 on, on cities but also SDG uh, 6 and 7 on water and energy as well as um, SDG 12 on sustainable consumption and production. So the combination of all this is very important for environmental planning and management in cities. So this has reached for the first time in the development history the, 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 the summit basically of, of development discourse, whereas in the past cities work and environmental planning in cities was, was relegated to a much more technical, technical issue. So now it has reached that attention, so we need to, in the next 12 years that are remaining in the SDGs, to make maximum advantage of that to promote better environmental planning and management in, in cities. 
So I, um, I'm going to to give a few um, uh, remarks on on a number of sustainable development targets that are particularly re relevant for this topic. One being uh, target 11.3, which focuses on um, the and there's an indicator there on the ratio of land consumption to population growth, actually the efficient use of land, and, and this is closely related to urban sprawl, which is a very important dimension of environmental management of cities at a, at a city level scale. Then secondly, I'm going to give a few remarks on the environmental impact of cities, um, specific mention on air quality and waste management, which are again uh, SDG 11.6. And finally, on the, the, the action planning in cities, uh, that is 11.B, which um, asks to substantially increase the number of cities uh, that are developing inclusive um, uh, or, or action plans towards inclusion, resource efficiency, mitigation, adaptation to climate change, and resilience to disaster. So this is the basic, the, the action planning, which is a process uh, indicator or a process target that supports obviously the other outcome targets such as uh, air pollution, solid waste and, and fighting sprawl. So in, in that perspective, there's a few key concepts that I think it's important to remember. Uh, what, what is resource efficiency in a, in a city? And what we define as a resource efficient city is a city that is significantly decoupled from resource exploitation and ecological impacts, and that is socioeconomically and ecologically sustainable in the long term. So the decoupling concept is extremely important that we, there is a, a belief that you can pursue um, economic growth and prosperity without impacting uh, negatively on ecological um, uh, resources. The other concept that I think we need to keep in mind, a very complex one, is ecological footprint, which basically represents the productive area that is required to provide the renewable resources that humanity is using uh, to absorb its wastes. So that, that area, this footprint, is a critical indicator, uh, I would say more in the advanced circles of focusing on environmental management for cities. It's not something that is accepted uh, in the mainstream and not in the SDGs, but nonetheless it's a very important uh, concept for managing urban ecological um, uh, planning and management. And finally, urban sprawl, and that brings me to this um, to this uh, target 11.3, is the physical expansion of a city's built environment um, using up surrounding rural areas. And um, it, it is generally characterized by low density settlement, which is car dependent and often lacks um, access to urban infrastructure and services. So, and this is something that is, is very serious because urban expansion and urban sprawl has grown uh, proportionally much faster than um, the city population. So, and this is something that has happened over the past two decades from the 90s onwards essentially, and systematically in all regions of the world. This is not only a phenomenon that has happened in, in the United States and in Europe, but also in Africa and Asia. It's a universal phenomenon and at different speeds in different regions, but it's something that makes it very difficult to be more efficient and more ecologically efficient in, in city management because you're dealing with a much larger area of urban footprint for uh, per, per capita. And, and this is for any attempt to address environmental issues, environmental planning and management, there would need to be a long-term commitment to reducing ecological footprint and reducing urban sprawl. We believe this is fundamental, it's a long-term goal, it's not something that can be easily fixed, but it can be easily measured. It can be easily measured because cities, uh, the, the built-up area, some cities would, would um, have a total stop 
especially cities in the north, uh, stop on further occupying productive agriculture area for city development and only allow um, densification. But in other cities, in rapidly growing cities in Africa and South Asia, for instance, it means proportionally reducing this kind of uh, this disproportion between um, city growth and population growth so that you have let's say less city growth for a certain amount of population growth that means reducing the sprawl effect and gradually becoming more compact um, and allowing for more integration of functions in the city more inclusion um, more resilience to climate change more connectivity which are all consequences or can be consequences if properly designed of reduced sprawl and more compact cities so this is a very important point to be observed and i, I believe it's something that has been advocated for uh, over the last 10 years but it it needs a lot of courage because there's come consequences on the cost of services on the prices of housing on affordability which sometimes needs intervention so that connects to some of your earlier lectures i believe but nonetheless in the long run it's probably the best investment that city managers can make to make is actively uh, fighting urban sprawl in a sensible manner but at least uh, putting the city on a positive curse, curve of compactness. The second point I would like to raise is that, um, yes, city environmental planning in city deals with the bigger issues and the, the framework of the city and the way the cities are structured and, and um, shaped, but also deals with a number of wastes and uh, pollution issues that are still very much uh, problematic. Two of them have been identified by the, by the SDGs, and that is solid waste collection and um, air quality. Now, solid waste collection is, is, a, is still a very big problem, and the numbers are very uh, shocking that, that in OECD countries, you have more than 95% of the waste is collected and properly treated, whereas in Africa, you have something like 45% and um, in um, in other areas 65 to 70 percent there's a huge discrepancy of the capacity the resources invested in solid waste which is worse even in slum areas so if you then take the the main subcontinents like sub-saharan africa and south asia where still slums are are, are uh, occupying a big proportion of urban areas that's where even slum um, upgrading, uh, sorry, where solid waste, municipal solid waste management is, is the worst. And the, the reason that this is so important is it has very severe health implications. Solid waste has important uh, connections to drainage, but also to, to direct uh, respiratory health. And of course, the other element which is picked up in the SDGs, which is the, um, uh, the ambient um, um, uh, particulate matter 2.5 is very critical as well for cities and again we see that by if you look at the figures by region and we're going to publish some of these figures in our upcoming uh, report on the progress of SDG 11 uh, now at the high level political forum in July in New York you see that uh, if you look at the death rates per 100,000 uh, population, uh, there are huge differences between, um, let's say, if you take Australia and New Zealand, 9 per 100,000, Europe and North America, 34 per 100,000, and you go to um, Central and Southern Asia, 103 per, per, um, uh, per 100,000, and Sub-Saharan Africa, 82 per 100,000. So there are, there are kind of scales of uh, 10 to 100 in terms of the death rates related to this particular matter, 2.5. So uh, we need to look at the, the metrics of both the spatial configuration as well as some of the key pollutants in the cities. So now um, moving to city action. Um, when I started my work with UN Habitat, uh, uh, 25 years ago, we started a program called Localizing Agenda 21. And this was just in response to the then agreement on environment and development um, in 1992, Agenda 21, and which was the first major move 
a call upon cities to develop their own environmental planning um, um, exercises uh, called localizing agenda 21 and uh, we worked for instance in this country where i'm where we are based our headquarters in um, in uh, kenya in nakuru and and one of the the successes of this approach was to to work at the same time on on strategic planning on kind of reviewing the shape and the uh, the, the way the city was growing and the city the city would grow in the future and to codify that in a strategic plan but at the same time also addressing immediate needs related to solid waste and um, related to um, uh, addressing uh, drainage and slum settlements and also addressing uh, disaster risk reduction in in some parts of the settlements that were prone to uh, subsidence so it, it's always a combination of long-term planning as well as immediate action that is visible for the population especially those ones uh, that are further further left behind combination of these two with very good engagement of different actors that have an influence that means com combination of relations between central government and local government between local government and citizens local government and private sectors that i think can guarantee success in environmental planning and management so over a period of five years we managed to to get a new strategic plan endorsed and at the same time have uh, about 15 very specific actions that were short-term visible and that were much more punctual sectoral actions or uh, uh, space specific actions that were addressing some of the the critical elements in in urban environmental management since then and i'm talking now about the early 90s many cities have followed this this path cities in the north in the south of course there has been a, a huge um, uh, increase of such action due to the climate uh, debate and the climate agreement and the global covenant of mayors so some of these environmental planning exercises have been a bit overshadowed by climate action planning both for mitigation and adaptation which i'm sure you have discussed also in this in in this course but in many cases those ones are also addressing the same issues are also addressing um, the careful use of space to avoid um, unnecessary mobility to avoid um, uh, kind of uh, large um, excessively large plots which which has a number of knock and knock on effects on on inefficient and environmentally unfriendly um, cities so uh, climate change has played a lot biodiversity agenda has played a lot also um, a, a big role in 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 raising the the importance of of city action planning um, uh, and uh, generally um, I would say there are many cities in, in the north, in the south, thousands of cities that have taken action, but very few cities have really been able to do a very well-rounded and sustained action plan that, that, that perpetuates across different municipal administrations, different political regimes, and that really, let's say for 20, 30 years, you, 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 you sustain some of these actions and you reevaluate, adapt, to new new stresses or new new interests that are coming up um, and part of the reason why um, some of these things are, are, are not sufficiently um, uh, dominant I would say in in, in in larger number of cities in the world is is that there's still a poor understanding of the different scale levels that the action between what happens in a neighborhood what happens at the level of a, of a, a city what happens at the level of a, an, a city region are very much interconnected and especially the environmental dimension is in interconnected and without harmonious um, uh, linking up of these different plants the environmental aspect of it between these different levels is very difficult to have impact in in the medium or long long term um, another another reason why um, why we haven't seen uh, sufficient uh, sufficient uh, progress is that i think the the in an incomplete 
decentralization or devolution, whereby you have, yes, devolution to uh, lower levels of government, responsibility for um, action planning, climate action planning, but not sufficient resources to initiate these, these actions. And uh, so this kind of half devolution, giving responsibilities, but not necessarily devolving resources, is another reason why this, this, this movement hasn't gone uh, far enough. Um, maybe um, to close on this, um, I would like to... Yes, the political will is another, maybe the, the third most important um, aspect that, uh, you know, you, you're essentially dealing with sustained action over at least a generation, sometimes more. And you see the best results in cities that have started this work in the 70s, in the 80s. There are cities like in Malmö in Sweden that started this work when they, ha they had an industrial crisis in the, in the 80s and continued across different municipal administrations to always update their, their environmental planning as part of broader economic and, and social planning in, in their cities. So um, it has been a, an agenda of, over the last 40 years with, I think, very strong uptake in the last 20 years and more particularly recently with the climate change movement. But much more is needed. And I would say there are three criteria which are have to be kept in mind when, uh, when uh, developing this, this, this agenda in cities. One is integration, trying to integrate different sectors, different, um, different neighborhoods, uh, different groups of population in this action. Uh, second, innovation, always rethinking uh, business as usual, moving away to, to much more innovative ways of, of acting, of measuring, of collaborating. And finally, inclusion, that is really bringing the different groups uh, from both rich and poor neighborhoods together, private sector, different all uh, public uh, sector agencies uh, together um, in, in, an, in an integrated manner. And that I think will, the combination of this integration, in, uh, innovation and inclusion is probably um, a prerequisite for success in environmental planning and management. I leave it here and looking forward to a good discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Raf. Uh, thank you so much, Raf. Uh, I think uh, uh, we we'll uh, go straight on to the questions now. Uh, one of the first questions we have is from Paloma from India. And she would like to know, uh, I mean, she would like for you to comment on the, suit, uh, the land suitability evaluation as a mechanism for determining land use options, especially as a tool for reinforcing the land use of forests or restoring the landscape. Yes, I think this is a, um, an important methodology and I would say the landscape, uh, the fragmentation of the landscape is, is probably one of the elements that is uh, the awareness about the fragmentation of the landscape and the problems related to the fragmentation of the landscape is something that came up really as a, as a result of the biodiversity uh, summit. And we, we did some um, analysis about how uh, this this landscape fragmentation can can be addressed in the context of fighting um, urban sprawl. Uh, there are different models uh, that have been used. One of the good examples, I think, is Berlin, which you know where where you use a certain uh, physical spatial model about how the city can grow, how to allow nature to come into the city, but in a consistent manner, that the, the patches of, of the nature that you bring into the city are sufficiently large that they can sustain um, ecological vibrancy in an urban in an urban environment so i think this this method this method is very very suitable um, we see that again and i mentioned this point um, earlier that you need to apply this at the right level at the right scale level sometimes if you do this at a scale level that is too low too too small it is uh, difficult to take advantage of all the opportunities of the combination of land suitability and the, con the, the congruence of land forms across a certain territory. So finding the right scale for doing this analysis is absolutely critical. Uh, thanks, Rob. 
Uh, after this, uh, the next question is from Dominic, who is a civil servant in Brussels. And uh, he would like to know if practically we had to take a huge slum and we had to rehabilitate it without causing any harm to its inhabitants, what would be the best way to go about it? So if we have a large slum, it would be unwise to, to think about um, a very drastic uh, measure because you would you would it would be too expensive would be socially totally um, disruptive and you would also lose of uh, lose a lot of economic benefits so what we would propose is to 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 treat a slum as an um, a kind of a um, a fully fledged urban district in the making uh, and and to be able to serve such a role you need to make space for certain key infrastructure which will allow uh, then also productive um, um, you know productivity of that that, that city fragment to to, uh, to to occur that means first of all creating space public space uh, creating public space in slums is a prerequisite and of course you will you will lose out you'll have to uh, move around maybe 10 percent of the population we see that some of the slums have uh, some something like eight or nine percent of public space whereas an, a good a uh, healthy city neighborhood would have much more than 25 30 percent open space um, open space so you need to first of all create that open space in the right in the right areas by moving some structures moving some people uh, creating a process of densification but also creating a process of increased value along these major axes and then with that value, so you, you, you're creating value and with that value, you can reinvest that value into the basic infrastructure so that gradually the whole population of this slum can get better access to water, uh, better access to electricity and, not, and other services. And then once you have done that, automatically you'll create a process of, um, of, of uh, self-improvement by citizens and also densification they will they will see the value of the land and try to um, uh, make use of this value and contribute uh, to the the public good through through taxes and at the same time that could accelerate the the environment so you would you would other you would be able to accommodate more than the current population but in a very different form in the same neighborhood but you cannot do it without displacing anybody there will have to be uh, there will have to be some displacement but there are methods to do it in a correct way and where people are very clearly sensitized about the benefits of of working in that way there's a lot of protocols a lot of procedures a lot of successful um experiences but as you know uh, there are still about one billion people living in slum-like conditions so there's still a lot of work to be done and it is not an easy way it's not a, an easy solution it's much easier to to lay out um, a new settlement at the periphery uh, than to upgrade a slum in a in an in a relevant in a, in a in a way where it contributes to the overall productivity of the city uh thank you uh the next question uh that we have is uh, uh he would like to ask what are the legal obligations for cities to build sustainable buildings or facilities which are more efficient and encourage people to live or work or be more sustainable i mean i think he comes from the point of view that right now it is it i mean we have understood the importance of it but i mean what are the legal obligations that could actually make it a uh, you know a phenomenon yeah so we we need to be clear that these these frameworks um of all these frameworks that have been recently approved like the the sustainable development goals the new urban agenda the sendai framework uh, which are all very relevant to the topic we are discussing none of these is binding these are just um these are global frameworks where governments agree at a high level political level and they commit to look at progress every year and look at uh, every four years at heads of state level so there's a certain factor of <coughs> uh, 
um, celebrating success and naming and shaming to a certain extent, but not too much. So it's not like the Paris Agreement, which has some level of uh, uh, legally binding um, uh, agreement, uh, like the Kyoto Protocol was, was even much stronger in, in terms of that. But uh, so we need to do it differently. It's not like you can use a convention where you really forcefully implement this. But there's enough, I mean, we don't need to look for more soft law. There is enough uh, international um, commitments by heads of state, by mayors, that go in this direction. The question is then how to turn that into political will at a local level and also adapted regulations, adapted local leg legislation that moves in this direction. For instance, a commitment to decrease the use of um, greenfield areas per year. And this is a very simple metric. You know, we move from X number of hectares per year to a lower amount per year. This is a, a commitment that any politician locally can make if the population believes in that that's a good direction for, uh, for, for the city. So these things have to be codified locally. Sometimes it happens at a national level where a national government can provide guidance or conditional grants related to environmental um, indicators. That's also a possibility. But there is no global legal framework that is binding. Now, the other dimension of sustainable consumption and production, I think, is even more, um, more difficult to enforce. Of course, it, it impacts people's life uh, more directly even than long-term sustainable urban development issues. But again, through very specific incentives or taxes or um, banning certain products or banning certain behaviors, I think a local government or a subnational government can also contribute to this in 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 uh, conjunction with with um, actions that are taken at the national level. Thanks. Uh, the next question uh, that we have is: uh, while uh, the larger industries have have been closely scrutinized in terms of the environmental impact that their work has and the how they're impacting the vicinity of their particular factories or any other uh, manufacturing establishment that they have but it is still a problem to regulate or to get the small and medium enterprises involved in these sustainable efforts so how can we go about uh, making that also and making the making the whole industrial environmental monitoring thing a more inclusive effort by including them as well Yes, I think that's a very good point, and indeed, it's it's easier to get uh, results when dealing with larger entities uh, because they have more capacity. They sometimes see the the benefit, the the PR or the economic benefit of moving into a certain direction. But for the small garages and small production units around along polluted rivers, it's very difficult and very difficult to enforce as well, and sometimes very costly to make. Uh, to make uh, changes in in technology, in production technology or waste treatment technology, uh, f which are sometimes uh, seem to be um, undoable or or far beyond the capacity of a small scale unit. So. Um, you know, there, there is, uh, and at the same time, we see the benefits of having a kind of fine-grained mixture of different um, types of industries uh, for different reasons, for um, in terms of inclusion, as you as you indicated, but also to to be able to integrate productive measures in the frame of a city. If, if you go to larger production units, you're almost forced to have them on the outskirts of the city, which again separates work from uh, work from housing, which further exacerbates environmental issues. So it's important that we get also the small and medium scale enterprises right in their environmental pollution by keeping them also within the, the fabric of the cities. Now, Organizations like UNIDO uh, have done a lot of very good work there. It's not our area of specialization with habitat. It's it's to do. It's a lot to do with with um, appropriate technology, thinking outside the box, uh, not immediately moving to the very expensive investments. Um, also, sometimes trying to group uh, investments 
amongst uh, different uh, different uh, group of association of, of industries and especially the capacity development and the technical advice to to upscale it to groups of industries rather than having it done on a, on a, on an individual scale but i would say there the resources that you will find are within the united nations would be found uh, very well within the, the websites and the advisory services of UNIDO, the industrial development organizations of the United Nations. Great. Uh, the next question that we have is from Paloma in, from India. She would like to know how does the integrated land use planning measures, how do these measures help in scaling up the sustainable land management practices in mega cities? Yes, in mega cities, I think the the issue there is is sometimes the scale is so huge that you don't even know where to where, where to start, and um, in in uh, you know and again it's about it's about working at the right at the right scale. Uh, where I, I was saying before that sometimes you know if you deal with land um, lands in, if you try to involve um make land reform to make it more integrated sometimes you need to you need to find the right scale and i don't think the mega city is there is the right scale it would be much more um a scale that is related to the major infrastructure investments within a mega city for instance if you if a mega city decides to develop a new um a new mobility system a new rail system um then use that as a as an as an entry point for in more integrated land use around the nodes of such systems i think there must have been another another semi webinar on, on this topic where you use the 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 density potential of of public infrastructure and mobility to stimulate integration and you start from that by integrating businesses, integrating um, uh, government services, integrating uh, small-scale enterprises, and um, different types of housing, uh, mixing uh, affordable housing with with more upper upper income housing, in an in an integrated way around these nodes, which have a, a particular value in their own. And I think this is a better way to address this in uh, larger cities rather than having a, a flat out uh, system that applies to all neighborhoods equally. I think that's, that's virtually impossible. So you need, to, you need to see where you can have the best impact, the quickest, and in many cases, this happens through, through revitalization efforts or through urban, urban transport efforts. Thanks, Rap. Uh, the next question we have is from Bangladesh. And Pauline would like to know, how do we integrate the disaster vulnerability analysis in a master plan for the preparation, in the master plan preparation process for a city? Well, I, I would say we need to reverse the priorities here. Issues like disaster vulnerability and protecting uh, nature, um, elements in a city should come first it should be actually the first thing you look at when developing a master plan rather than the last one and sometimes it's an afterthought but it should be the first one because these are issues that can that are going to be there forever you cannot change them fundamentally issues of topography hydro, um, hydrology um, vulnerability to uh, to subsidence, earthquake, you know, these are things that you cannot fix, that will have to be there, you need to recognize them and almost set aside certain areas of the city that will be um, where, where habitation will be discouraged uh, rather than encouraged and where, so I think it's the, the, the starting point, reverse uh, nature scape in cities should be the starting point of the master plan before you even think about large infrastructure and before you think about certain sectors of the city so it's almost turning the the, the traditional master planning uh, routines um, upside down by focusing on on nature and resilience as a structuring element of master planning i i think uh 
that that really addresses what he was trying to get there. Uh, the next question that we have is from Leanne. She says, Portland region has an urban growth boundary and Beaverton wants to expand, which will deforest 1,200 plus acres, despite the lack of multi-story housing in the city. How do we encourage the city to densify within the urban growth boundary instead? Yes, it's a, it's a, I think Portland is a very good example. It has been studied well. We, I remember we had um, discussions with the chief planner of Portland. And of course, it's not an easy thing to do. And it's a, it's a solution, this urban growth boundary that is, um, is not used by many cities because it's, um, it's, it's almost, it, it's making your life very difficult because you kind of legislate an, um, a, a boundary and of course, it has been tried in many, many cities, but it hasn't been successful in many cities. Um, you know, this is something that we, we believe that, especially to be dynamic and to be able to keep uh, housing uh, affordable, there must be some space for growth. Um, there should not be an absolute, an absolute boundary, but a boundary that is relative to the way cities are growing. That means if a city is very successful and attracting an increase of population, um, a significant increase of population, you cannot keep such a boundary uh, forever. You need to be flexible. You can, you, you, you need to to be to know that when your city is growing, you you will have to give way. But the question is then where. And of course, it should not be. It should be a combination of densification, as you're suggesting. But the densification has also its limitations to where it can be applied. So it should be a kind of a mixture of densification actions with very specific extension. Sometimes satellites, sometimes in the bound uh, in the, the boundaries of the city, but not a kind of a massive opening up, but a very deliberate. Uh, looking at specific places where expansion can happen and so that the the the, the house prices or the the, the yes are, are are controlled otherwise you you kind of you you're uh, stalling your economic um your economic uptake of a certain city or a city region by by creating an artificial boundary so whereas in theory this seems to be maybe a nice um, idea to it. The com compactness does not imply uh, a growth boundary. Com compactness is a much more fine grained concept that looks at, at um, uh, different neighborhoods of the city. How compact are they? Where can we densify and where can we expand? And sometimes there is a good argument for expansion. But when you define this ground, uh, this growth boundary, you're really going into very, very difficult territory. It's definitely something to think about. I, I, I mean, urban growth boundary is not a practice in, I think, many of the developing countries and maybe for good reason. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the next question that we have is from Bakshish from India. How does the government utilize urban communities, rural urban, urban communities towards economic benefits for the community and also enhance environmental sustainability in the process? Yes. Um this is um it's an issue of uh, you know looking at urban rural linkages and how you basically value the different types of settlements across a territory it's it's it gets to the essence of territorial planning as you know maybe habitat has issued a couple of years ago uh, international guidelines on urban and territorial planning it's important to so that we we look at all the different, you know, where urban is not only seen as, as cities, but as a continuum from small settlements uh, in rural areas to larger settlements, to small towns and uh, to, to, to large cities. And you're looking at planning practice and productivity and prosperity in all levels of settlements, not only focusing on the, on the big cities. In fact, in many cases, you need to incentivize investment in different settlements in in uh, in intermediate cities so that they can play a role in between rural the rural areas and the 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 larger cities and, and some and sometimes this can be done cheaper at lower cost and at higher satisfaction 
of the, the residents of these uh, cities. Now, the rural urbanization concept um, is, um, is, is, is another interesting development where I think you, you refer to how within urban settlements you, you, you see rural patterns re-emerging. Huh? And I think this is something that we have seen in, in cities, especially in Africa, for instance, in uh, Kinshasa, where the, you know, it's almost like as a negative, a negative concept where the city fails to provide services and, and provide an urban life that is significantly different from the qualities of rural life, then people tend to go back to rural habits within an urban framework. Now, of course, then you, you have the worst of both worlds. Yeah? In many cases, you then create an, um, you have an urban environment where you go back to, to uh, using cook stoves, uh, you go back to, um, to very traditional methods of, of producing food and with a lot of dangers because you're basically mixing some of the urban life into an urban, uh, sorry, rural life in an urban settlements without having the rural hinterland to care for. So I think we need to be careful. It's an interesting sociological and, and um, human settlements phenomenon, but I think it's more a reflection of the failure of larger cities to, to really, um, that, that are growing too, too quickly without sufficient employment and sufficient resources, whereby you're creating this kind of reversal of rural life in urban environments. Yes. Uh, the next question that we have is from Soumya, who's a conservation architect in India. And she would like to know if there is any example or any model example where the historic core and the natural resources of the city has been integrated um efficiently and seamlessly in a in a master plan hmm. yes this is a very interesting um question and i think uh, i need to think about which example because of course there are many um there are many cities which use um historic core and have been using them to a very big benefit for the city development. Um, now, in, in many cases, um, cities uh, originate around rivers, and in, especially in, in the history of Europe and United States and India, for instance, there are many cities around rivers. So the, the combination of revitalization of a historic core and a river uh, revitalization, I think, is a very feasible option where you can bring back nature into the city. Um, I think uh, Seoul is maybe a good example, where you, where you know, you 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 revitalize the inner city by revitalizing one of the natural element, in in case a river, and then attract also attention to to the historic heritage around that because you're in the very historic center of the city. So I think it's possible to do that. And in fact, this is uh, one of the SDG targets, 11.4, uh, that I have not mentioned in, in my um, introduction, which focuses on um, increasing the effort and financial effort of cities and countries to invest in both cultural and natural heritage. And uh, you know it's a it's a tricky concept because it's about how much budget is released every year by countries and cities to invest in culture and natural heritage preservation. So it's an important international um, call also within the SDGs, and it's possible. Um, we need to look, but uh, to me the the easiest way and the most obvious way is to look at uh, revitalizing rivers, making sure that rivers can again uh, be used for fishing for swimming in the center of cities and you know you can see that in certain towns this is the ultimate achievement when you can when you can allow people to swim again in the center of cities that means that all the upstream pollution has been cleared that you have managed to to control environmental um, uh, uh, pollution and that you have uh, wildlife and allow people to again enjoy enjoy um, rivers, reservoirs, etc. in an urban area. Uh, the next question is from Paolo from Lisbon. And he would like to know how uh, 
are the how would you reconcile the different municipal policy priorities uh, in a which which go beyond a city level and uh, more into a regional level and how do you uh, actually integrate their multi-scale approaches and their priorities towards fossil free mobility yes a very good question it it, it goes to the the concept of multi-level governance um, you see there has been attempts in the past to try to to abolish uh, small local governments because uh, it is found that they, it's difficult for them to to deal with bigger issues such as mobility because the, the scale is just too small but in doing so you are kind of undermining local democracy and accountability towards also the issues that are present at a lower scale neighborhood scale um, etc so I think we need to think about other concepts much more uh, rather than increasing the scale because you know mobility is better addressed at a, at, at a higher scale not sacrificing local governance but looking for innovative collaboration almost like ad hoc not permanent institutionalized because these these would then need other governance structures which would compete with local with very local governance structures but um, look at ad hoc collaboration agreements around certain investments for instance a number of districts a number of counties a number of um, adjoining urban areas to work together on a num on, on issues such as um, um, mobility but also issues like solid waste management and employment which typically can be handled better at a slightly higher level but with the existing democratic structures uh, voluntarily coming together making a pact time bound resource bound and implementing that for the benefit of all the citizens and not losing the local democracy in the process uh the next question is here the, he would like to know why do most of the developed fast growing cities almost only expand their boundaries due to a high demand for housing which is also often mostly managed by speculation because we do not see the inhabitation of those upcoming housings or townships in in maybe the next five years of its development and why do they pay so very little attention to the subsequent sustainable outcomes of creating such ad hoc housings or not reinforcing with it with adequate infrastructure no this is a very good question and it, it it goes to the you know sprawl is mainly mainly induced by by a housing that is peripheral housing because the land values are lowest and it's easiest to um, to, to, to do it, it you can uh, roll out um, thousands of units without much um, uh, care for land acquisition and uh, uh, diversity and, and because it's a, it's like a greenfield solution to housing and it has proven to be disastrous uh, in many countries where um, sometimes thousands, sometimes even millions of housing units are vacant because people simply do not want to live there. It's too far from employment, it's too expensive to go there, and there is no integration of functions, there's no social life, there are no attractions that any th that attracts them in the first place to the city. Th these attractions are not to be found in these monotonous housing developments outside the, the city boundaries. So Mexico is a good example. Uh, others are Iran, um, Russia. I mean, they're, they're different countries. I would say typically middle-income countries that had the resources to do that and then just try to optimize these resources based on low land values rather than looking at much more strategic areas for housing development within the existing urban um, urban boundaries which has numerous advantages in terms of social integration economic prosperity as well as environmental benefits by by reducing mobility by um, preserving agriculture land for agriculture and protecting also uh, biodiversity this is a i think it's we have we have reached a turning point because of people, uh, you know, the people are simply not longer, no longer interested to live there. Even if the housing units are are cheaper, they would rather 
find something that's much more integrated where uh, mobility costs can go down and social engagement and uh, and you know looking at the advantages that the city has to offer and those advantages are no longer there in many of these sprawling housing estates the problem is much damage has been done over the past few decades and we are there with ghost towns uh, that will take a long time to rehabilitate if they can ever be rehabilitated and um, but it is it's it's a far too common issue also in china for instance but china has has learned china has and mexico also they are, they are two two countries that have changed their legislation and changed their rules to to discourage and to encourage a housing investment in a much more integrated way uh, the next question is again from India and uh, Paloma would like to ask what is the role of transit oriented development in changing the landscape of the city and providing a network to connect with the urban sprawl with the while the mainstream and with the main uh, mainstream land management practices. Yes, transit oriented development is, I think, uh, fundamentally a good um, concept, but it should not be seen as a panacea for um, sustainable urban development. You see, you know, in, in the last couple of decades, some concepts have come up and then suddenly they become like the, the solution to all problems. I don't think TOD, transit oriented development, is, is like a, 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 um, a solution that is that is applicable to all um, urban uh, problems of mobility of density but when when properly done and well invested with social with 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 care for social concerns and also with with judicious choice of technology um, it can be a very good solution um, but of course you need to be be careful that you do not inflate housing prices too much around the the, the the nodes so you know when you when you have a government local government that is strong and that can enforce their plans and that is not subject to to ad hoc too much ad hoc decision making you can make TOD a very very good driver for sustainable development especially in areas where already the urban fabric is already very much problematic that you you need to patch up you need to really link certain areas that are simply too far because of historical reasons and then tod is a very good way of doing that to to revitalize certain neighborhoods um, and give them a new life and a much more integrated urban feel and much more connectivity to the urban center uh, but i would not I mean, like for instance, uh, so Johannesburg. I would say Johannesburg is a good, a good example. Johannesburg is a city that has been growing for probably 50, 60 years through an apartheid regime in a very disintegrated way. And the only way to connect it, you cannot, you you, you must find a kind of a linear approach to connect these different neighborhoods. And TOD is an excellent solution to that, to increase integrations, to increase land values and to bring investment back to these these nodes. I think uh, the next question is going to be one of the last questions that we have with the time left. Uh, Denise from Cambodia would like to know where does land management and environment management as two aspects, where do they converge and where do they part ways when we are looking at a sustainable development of a city? And also, is there any literature that she can refer to for this? Yes, um, where do they converge and where do they part ways? Of course, you know, in um, land management, I think it's a different, a different area. It's an area of how to, it's an administration area, how to make best use of available land, uh, considering the ownership, considering the, the tenure uh, system. Um, and, and it is a tool that is used once you have your your structure your urban future desired structure in place meaning uh, you, you legislated you can use land management as a tool to achieve your goal environmental management i think is a is an um, especially in the way i've presented it with a with a very strong uh, shape urban shape emphasis uh, and then urban health um, 
dimension. You know, these are fundamental things that that must be uh, th that really set the values, the, um, the the kind of the vision that really have to be translated fully within the vision of a city. Whereas land management is more a tool. It's a tool that based on on local culture, economy, and that you can use to then reach your goal that you set in an, in a broader. Uh, urban environmental management scheme. I would recommend you a series of four publications that we have done in the lead up to the Rio Plus 20 Summit in 2012. They are already a bit old, but I think they're still very valuable. It's called Urban Patterns for a Green Economy. Urban Patterns for a Green Economy. You can find them, of course, on the, on the internet. And the reason why I... Um, I like them is that they are addressing four different elements of um, of city sustainability with a strong economic slash environmental um, um, kind of uh, on the nexus of, of uh, urban economy and urban environment, and they look at uh, density, they look at com com uh, competitiveness of cities. Um, they look at uh, how to harmonize nature, how to bring nature into city planning and so on. And they are based on case studies. I think there are 42 case studies uh, spread over four volumes. And I really, they are very well written and very inspiring. And they cover all the regions of, of the globe. And they provide, at least five years ago, um, state-of-the-art good expertise in, in dealing with with um, with with you making use of good urban patterns for a, a green economy. Uh, well, um, unfortunately, that uh, that could that, that was the last question that we could take. Um, we really come to the end of our our long webinar. Thank you so much, Raf, for taking our time to do this. I mean. I think uh, we've had an amazing dialogue where people from all over the world have just poured in with their queries, which are very specific to where they're living or where they're working. And I hope that uh, they can take these learnings forward and actually implement them. That is, I mean, that is one of the entire aims of this course. And thank you so much for uh, being a part of this and taking time out to uh, educate us on this subject today. Thanks a lot. And thank you everyone for participating into the webinar. If you have any further questions, please mail them to us at cities at the rate sdgacademy.org and we will uh, try and get the responses to you at the earliest. Thanks again. Thanks a lot. Goodbye, thank everybody. Thank you.